Hi, I'm Eli with Off-Road Endeavor, and this is Project Misused. It's a 2001 Ford Sport Track, originally from the factory it came with independent front suspension and rear leaf springs. However, we're going to be adding a three-link front solid axle with coilovers and a four-link in the rear. So to get to that point of having a new suspension, we're going to need to do some measuring and some design, some calculations to figure out what behaviors we're looking for and what we can package on this. So follow along as we go through a couple of different steps in this video on how to prepare yourselves for that suspension change. So of three things, we're going to be first doing frame measurements. And then the second, we're going to be looking into the three length suspension calculator. And finally, we're going to be doing the data input into that calculator. So stick around and see what we come up with on Project Misused as we dive into this new suspension. Here's a simple example of how to start. We've got our first measurement for the center line of where the axle is going to be at full compression. It's 22 and 3 quarters on the X. It's 32 and 5 eighths on the Z. And 32 inch on the Y. So again, what that means is how far back our axle is, how high the frame is at that point, and then how wide the frame is at that point. So what I'll do now is go through and make all of my measurements from front to rear at every point that I can think of where the frame dips down, where the frame's level, where my uh, shock hoops are mounted, where the cross members are, things that might cause me interference, or where I might be needing to put a link mount. So when we're measuring with a plumb bob, one thing you might find is it swings a lot. You don't want to wait for it to center itself. So one of the tricks you can do is lower it so it just touches the ground and lift it and lower it just a couple of times where it just touches and then you bring it back up and that'll help center it. 28 and a half. So one of the problems you might see from back here is we've got the leaf spring still in place and the axle. It can't get the center line because we can't drop it from there. What we can do is we can get the edge of the axle. 151 and 7 eighths. Also, the frames sometimes go in and out depending upon the location. So if you need to get a measurement that's farther away from your tape measure, you can use a carpenter square. Just go ahead and move that along wherever the plumb bob falls. If we're out here, we now have our measurement. 151 and 7 eighths. Same as if we were right over the tape measure. Alright, so here I've got all my measurements down. I've got my rough drawing of my frame. I have all of my X measurements along that frame line. Just above that I have all my Z or my height measurements and some of them are labeled to help me understand where that is. And then also on the top line, I've got my frame separation measurements. And now that I've got all these measurements, I'm gonna to go to the computer, I'm gonna plug it in, I'm gonna model up my frame and my axles, and then I can work on the suspension calculator to see how things are gonna work. It's also gonna allow me to fine tune it for the different values, working on anti-squat and roll centers, I can come back out and check to see how physically they're going to fit and make sure I'm not running into any interference problems. So here's the frame measurements that I took and put into the modeling program. I've got now my frame rails, my axles, my shock hoops, the center of gravity. From here I can start building out and designing some different link positions and link mounts. This is the suspension calculator that Dan Barcroft created in an Excel program years and years ago. It's been utilized, I'm sure, across the world. It's really easy to be able to just plug in some values into these boxes and it'll automatically adjust these lines down here. It'll also calculate for your suspension geometry for anti-squat, roll center, and things like that. And then we can play around with them here to determine the length, the droop. It's a really good calculator to get you in the ballpark 
This isn't going to be something that we need to be extremely precise in. It's not an exact science with the measuring that we're doing, estimating the center of gravity, and not knowing exactly how things are going to work. By having all these measurements that we took initially, we can know where our interferences are, and we can take those measurements and put them in, so those links will be where we'll actually be able to build them. It's going to allow us to get close, to be able to make some good estimates on where we need to set up our links to get the values that we want. However, in the real world, once we get it all set up and drive it, it might act a little bit different, how we expect it to feel versus what the numbers are. One of the things to consider is when you're building your link mounts on your axle and on your frame, is to build in different mounting holes. So just as an example, your upper link mount for your axle, instead of having just one fixed hole, you could have three holes separated an inch apart. That'll allow you to change the angles and get some different adjustability. As well as if you had it on the rear frame mounts, having that adjustability allows you to change the angles. Also, not having fixed welded links. That gives you a set length that you can't work with or adjust anymore. So having threaded ends on either one or both ends of your links will allow you some adjustability in rotating either the pinion or the different angles to help you get and fine tune what it is you're looking for. So this table right here is going to be where we input our measurements. We've got an X, a Y, and a Z category. Again, those are going to correlate to the measurements we took on the ground for the front to rear measurement, the ground to height measurement, and the separation of the frame measurement. With those numbers plugged in here, it will go through and give us our calculations. So it will give us our anti-squat, anti-dive, what it's called on the front end, how much it resists diving. The value of 100% is as you're accelerating or as you're braking, the front end of the vehicle is going to want to resist lifting and resist diving. So at 100% it would stay level. So the suspension calculator is going to require a few different values also. So while we're out here we can get those measurements. Those are going to be plugged in in that upper corner. The first one is going to be your wheelbase. The wheelbase is measured from the center line of the front axle to the center line of the rear axle. On this setup, I'm going to be running about 128 to 130 inches. So that's my wheelbase. Next is the tire diameter. Now the tire diameter is not necessarily what's printed on the sidewall of your tire. Some people have found up to an inch and a half difference in their actual measured diameter versus what's printed on the sidewall. My tire and wheel package is 42 inches. The tire diameter may be affected by the width of the wheel that you're mounted on as well. So the best way to do it is just take an unloaded tire and take the measurement of the overall diameter. The wheel diameter differs from the tire rolling radius, which is next. Tire rolling radius is not just half of the measured distance. That's due to the fact that the weight of the vehicle is compressing that tire, and the center line of the axle to the ground is a shorter distance than that from the center line of the axle to the top of the tread due to the compression of the tire and the sidewall bulge that you'll see. So best way is to have that vehicle weight on the tire while it's mounted to see what that measurement is. Even though mine is a 42 inch tire, it comes out a rolling radius of 20 inches. Next we have the center of gravity. The center of gravity can be estimated at the upper bow housing to engine bolt and mine is 44 inches. The last value we need to get is the weight of the vehicle. Going to your driver's door and opening it and looking at the sticker will give you the gross vehicle weight rating. That value is the vehicle total weight with all fluids and all passengers and any available load for the vehicle. That's the max that it can carry. The curb weight, however, is just the vehicle weight with the fluids and no other load. Those values are going to be completely different. For my sport track, the gross vehicle weight rating is 5,800 pounds. The curb weight is only 4,300 pounds, and so there's a value of 1,500 pounds that can be taken into account for the passengers and any load that goes upon it. Now you're going to have to calculate depending upon your usage. If we're upgrading the axles and tires, we've got a lot more weight in the axle and tires and suspension than we do from factory. Also, if we're going to be, say, overlanding, we're going to be putting up a tent camper 
we're going to be putting fuel cells, we're going to be carrying an extra spare tire. All those add weight. So we can add those in our calculation to figure out our total weight. Well, we're almost to the end now. I hope you've enjoyed the information that I provide to you in this short tutorial. Again, it's not a comprehensive gathering of all the information as it relates to suspension design. And as I went through, I didn't provide any values that I was searching for just because there's so many different parameters and modalities that people will be searching after. Your search for what is going to work best for you, whether it be rock crawling or desert racing or just street driving. There's different behaviors that you're going to look into. Please follow along for more episodes of Project Misuse as well as my Ford Excursion, other tools, tips, tricks, educational material, and endeavors. Remember to subscribe, like, hit that bell for notifications on new videos as they come up, and we'll see you on your next endeavor. Well, that's the end.